Yeah, so I haven't actually checked the, um, whether it's currently a billion dollars or not, whether we're still above one billion or, you know, the, the, the market for cryptocurrencies is going down and down and down. Um, but that's not my problem. That's, uh, that's, that's the business people's problem. I'm, I'm going to talk about the engineering. Um, so the intention of this talk is, is not really to tell you about this particular system. Um, the, the goal is more about transferable lessons. Um, and in particular, like how we're trying to do things by applying sort of lightweight formal methods. Um, that's, that's the overall goal, sort of lessons. So um, I will talk a little bit about our system, just to give context, um, but, but hopefully it'll be more about what, what we can learn from this kind of experience. So just very briefly about myself. Um, I'm a computer scientist, a Haskell programmer. Um, I've been programming Haskell for 20 years nearly. Um, and I've been a consultant, Haskell consultant for 10 years. Uh, and my, my academic background was in um, programming language design um, and Haskell specifically. So Cardano is a public cryptocurrency, blockchain cryptocurrency. Um, so you know, in the same class as uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, the, the biggest difference, if you don't know about these things, is that um, Cardano is based on what they call proof of stake rather than proof of work, and what that, what the, the practical effect of that is that it's not an environmental disaster. Um, it doesn't require vast amounts of electricity and huge numbers of machines to, to do the. It's not based on vast amounts of unnecessary computation. So that's a good thing. Um, a difference with Cardano compared to other systems is it is based on a lot of research, um, a lot of cryptographic research. Um, uh, and it's now just over one year old. There's a, there's a long roadmap um, uh, for this thing, and I, I don't want to go into lots of details about it uh, because that's not really the focus of this talk. Um, but you can, you, if you're interested in Cardano itself, you can find out more at the cardanoroadmap.com. Um, I should just say very briefly before I go on the relationship between who I am and what I do and the company that's making this system. I'm, I work for... Uh, uh, a Haskell consultancy company, and IOHK is our customer, and I'm, for whatever reason, ended up as kind of the head of engineering for this particular project. So that's, that's why there's a sort of joint um, uh, thing here. So the, the cryptocurrency space is quite uh, interesting and difficult. Um, there's lots of interesting design challenges, um, some which were sort of new to me when I came along to this space. Um, compared to many kinds of distributed systems that we build, um, the blockchain space is, is a highly adversarial environment. You know, everybody is out to get you. Um, you know, you're not deploying into a data center where you, know, you can kind of put firewalls around the outside. This is out in the, in the public sphere, and um, it's very hard to protect the systems. And there's money at stake, and you know, um, people will exploit what they can. So it's a, uh, yeah, highly adversarial. There are hard real-time constraints. They're measured in seconds rather than milliseconds, but nevertheless, there are hard real-time constraints for uh, these proof-of-stake um, cryptocurrency uh, um, protocols. Um, the system breaks down very quickly if you start missing these deadlines. There's lots and lots of concurrency in these systems. Uh, software flaws, as you know, can be completely fatal to a, to a system like this, and, and everybody believes there's lots of money at stake, so um, you know, software flaws are uh, you know, even more important than in your average system. Um, we can't control who runs the code, or where they do it, or how they do it. You know, this is just something that you give out to everybody, and they run it on their own systems. And you can give them advice, but whether they'll take your advice or not, um, and yet you still have to meet these you know, hard real-time constraints and performance constraints, even though you don't know the kind of setting in which your code is running. And it turns out the internet is really not uh, friendly for peer-to-peer -peer systems. Everybody talks about you know, these, these things as being peer-to-peer -peer and you know there's, there's lots of peer-to-peer -peer systems but actually peer-to-peer -peer systems on the internet are, are not that easy to to get to work um, reliably and without lots of hassle for the users so there's lots of these challenges um, but there's also then therefore uh, corresponding there's lots of opportunities for applying good computer science and that's what we've been the approach we're trying to take um, so there's a balance here between, you know, you have to deliver stuff that users want. And in the cryptocurrency space, if you know anything about it, you know that the users are all um, 
they have very high expectations um, that some of them have put lots of real money into these things uh, and they, they expect you know, the, 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 all these promises to be delivered. And there are lots and lots of different people making different promises. So uh, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a slightly crazy space. Um, so users want all the things that they've been promised. Uh, and they also want it now, and they have no appreciation of why things take a while to build. And they also want not just all the features, and they want it now, but they also want, oh, and obviously it should be secure and performant and reliable, et cetera, et cetera, um, without really appreciating the trade-offs between these things. So quality is obviously very important in, in these systems. There's, you know, if, if you believe that a cryptocurrency is a real currency, then you believe there's lots of money at stake, and so the quality is, is important. Um, and the opportunity to fail is all over the place in, in this area. And, and not all of them, you know, so there's the obvious kind of failures like bugs in your code, but that's actually only just one class of the many different classes of, of failure. You can have uh, the protocol design, the actual cryptographic protocol can be wrong. Um, there's many examples of that. Uh, you can then, you know, bugs in your implementation. Um, I just, you fail to implement what you wanted to do or there's just, you know, the typical bugs. Cryptography, um, it's easy to do that wrong. Uh, you can miss performance deadlines. You can have a system that collapses when, there's, uh, when its maximum load is applied. Um, you can have a system which works perfectly well, but if it doesn't scale to the demands that users have of it, then the system may ultimately not be successful, even if, like, just looking at the software, the software is perfect. Like, at the moment, uh, in the last sort of year or so, um, you know, Ethereum has been going through, well, sort of market difficulties because... Um, it, it's at its capacity, basically, and, and so it, it, is, it is not scaling in the way that um, the users would like it to scale. These systems are, are, can be attacked by denial of service, either sort of point denial of service or distributed, but, but even the you know, point ones are uh, interesting and tricky. You can have economic attacks on these systems where the costs that are incurred by the operators are not balanced by the fees paid by the users, and if there's that kind of imbalance, you know, you, then the system can collapse because people operating the system are like, why should I put up with this? You know, I'm not being compensated for, for running the system as I, as I, you know, and you're incurring the costs that, that I am. These things can collapse due to governance. You know, they can just fail to adapt and change and make progress because of governance. Or, indeed, macroeconomic collapse. There's all kinds of, you know, non-software things as well as all of the software things that, that can cause these systems to either not work or fail to deliver in the, in the long run. Um, and so you need expertise in all these different areas. And no one's an expert in all of these things. I may be an expert in two, maybe. Um, so you need, you know, these are multidisciplinary projects to do these things successfully. You, know, you need your people who are experts in game theory and voting systems and macroeconomics and whatnot uh, if you want to make one of these systems that's going to succeed. In addition to all of the computer science. Um, which is, you know, my, my focus. In our industry as a whole, um, I, don't, I don't mean cryptocurrencies, I mean the entire programming IT uh, industry, we have this big problem with a, with a big gap between, uh, you know, what goes on in, in research, either in academia or, or in industry, and, and implementations. Um, I, I saw this a lot when I was you know, a PhD student. And, and you, you, I, I see it now with, even within a single company, you can have great research going on, but, but not being able to connect that through to what's delivered. Um, so the first sort of interesting thing, I think, um, about what we've been doing uh, with IOHK is trying to bridge that gap within the single company. So IOHK actually put a lot of money into um, doing original research. For, for being a relatively small company, it's put significant resources into doing original research in cryptography and governance, protocol design, uh, voting systems, game theory, all, all the things that you need, all these bits of research that you need to build, to build one of these systems. Um, but you can't just you know, take a bunch of papers and then just chuck it to a bunch of engineers and say, go on, build it. Um, that, that doesn't work out. Um, so one thing that we have, we have done with IWHK is, is put in place uh, a, a pipeline between the two by putting in um, different kinds of computer scientists in the middle. So cryptographers are computer scientists, but they're a very different kind of computer science from the corner that I'm familiar with. Um, and, and I can see why it was so difficult for a bunch of programmers and a bunch of cryptographers to understand each other. Um, they, they have almost no overlap in uh, language, programming language, uh, context, 
Um, it's actually a huge gap. And, and I think that that's not a unique case. I mean, this is, as I say, I think it's a general problem that we have in our industry. Um, so you can have another group of people in the middle that can understand both ends and not just help them to understand each other, but to, to provide a pipeline to get you know, feedback to, to researchers and push things through to, uh, towards implementations. Um, and this is, this is the opportunity to apply good computer science, to apply interesting ideas that you know, we all know about from, um, from papers, from academic experience, uh, et cetera. Um, and that, that's, that's the main thing I want to sort of talk about, is how we are using lightweight formal methods to, to try and improve the quality of the software. Uh, and it's, it's this group in the middle that, that's key to doing that. Um, so we have to balance quality and, and time to delivery. Right? There's no good producing something perfect years after the market cares about it. Um, so the, there is a trade-off, but it's not an obvious, it's not a straightforward trade-off. It's not just a case of, you know, do things more sloppily and cut more corners and you'll, you'll deliver things quicker uh, because, you know, bad software uh, is very uh, slow to work with, very slow to deploy, very slow to fix, very slow to put into, put into production in the first place if it doesn't work. Um, I mean, we all, we all know this, right? You know, that fixes, things that you discover late in, in the process are much, much harder to fix than you know, fixing things early. So, you know, what are the techniques that you can do to pull those things earlier and resolve those problems at the beginning rather than at the end? Um, so cryptocurrencies are a great place to apply formal methods, um, or as I'll talk about in a second, sort of semi-formal methods or lightweight formal methods. Um, and so, so some formal methods are still slower compared to just hacking things. Um, so you know, I, I don't want to say that you can, you can go fully formal and everything will be fine. Um, that, that is not necessarily the right trade-off between time to delivery and, and quality. Uh, it certainly can produce very high quality. Um, so the, the approach that we take is sort of in between. It's, it's as I say, lightweight uh, formal methods where you, you take many of the ideas from formal methods about properties, that things should do, specifications, how you can test this against that, but you don't necessarily prove anything. You, you use testing approaches rather than proof approaches, but you still make use of sometimes the, uh, the ideas, the, uh, the, the, the languages for describing things, the syntax, the logic. Um, and we take a twin, twin track approach where we, we, we kind of do rapid prototyping with semi-formal approaches and then at a, at a later, on, on a longer time scale, follow up with actual formal methods, doing actual proofs using proof assistance and whatever other uh, appropriate technologies um, so that we can deliver something and have it be good enough and then on a longer time scale follow up with uh, higher assurance because IOHK in the end is promised its users to uh, achieve higher, higher levels of assurance than, than other um, uh, systems in the market. So, I mean, just a couple of examples of this. Um, the, a wallet is a part of a cryptocurrency system. Um, we, had a, we, 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 we built a, a new wallet based on a, um, a formal specification, but not one that was, you know, the one that was just mathematics on paper, essentially. I mean, la LaTeX. Um, but, but not, not using any um, formal proof assistant or anything. And then we built a, an implementation based on that. Um, but we, we have someone who is following up the, the work that we did in specifying and testing and building that system, uh, building that component, um, following up proving properties that we stated and tested, trying to prove them using uh, a, a proof uh, system, using the, the, the Koch um, uh, theorem proving uh, system. So that, I think that's actually a, good, really a nice example. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about, I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail about one of these examples a little later. But the basic idea there is that you are, you're using the ideas of you know, uh, proof and logic um, and you're, you're stating what properties you think ought to be true about your system and, and writing things in a formal mathematical style. But then in the first go, you simply write down those properties and you test them so that does not give you the same you know, uh, degree of assurance as having proved them, but it's really a lot better than the industry standard. Um, industry standard is you know, really comparatively low compared, compared to that. That's actually quite a good quality of evidence. Um, 
And then on a longer time scale, you can achieve you know, that higher degree of assurance by, by proving things uh, formally with a proof assistant. And we've got a couple other examples where we're doing this kind of thing, where we're taking this kind of semi-formal approach first and following up uh, later with uh, other, other slower techniques that, that achieve higher degrees of assurance. Um, so people often ask when I sort of talk about this stuff is, are you, you know, you're, are you giving up on Agile? This looks like big upfront design, and that's, surely that's a bad thing, right? Um, and sort of, um, I, I, I suppose I would sort of plead guilty to that. Um, but I think the, the, the point here is that in, with difficult problems, and I think this, this space, the cryptocurrency space, is, does have, a, as I was saying earlier, a number of, of really quite difficult problems. Um, where there are very difficult trade-offs. You, you, know, you don't just have a great big design space where you can just pick basically any point in that design space that'll work. That's not the case. There's, there's very few points in this design space that will actually work. And so you can't, uh, your kind of search technique, if you like, for finding a solution can't just be, oh, there's something and it works, which is kind of what you can get away with when you're building you know, business, database, web systems. I mean, and maybe I'm being slightly frivolous there, but you get what I mean. You can apply a kind of, you know, this kind of agile search technique for finding a solution um, is just, you know, make local changes, local optimizations all the time until you get to something that works. And that's, that's absolutely fine when your space has loads of solutions, but when it's got only a few solutions, you have to take a more, a diff different search approach. Um, and, you know, what I said at the beginning, as we all know, uh, in, in complicated systems, fixing bugs at the end is much harder than you know, resolving those problems and, uh, up front. Um, so in that sense, yes, you are pulling, you, you, you want to use techniques that pull these difficult um, design problems early, as early as possible. So in, in some sense, that is you know, more upfront design. But that doesn't mean that it's like design on paper that has no connection to reality. Um, because the point is you want to use logical languages and formal, formal languages to, to be precise about those, um, those upfront designs. So you're still doing programming, but you're doing it at the highest possible level of abstraction so that you can uh, resolve those problems in the simplest possible setting uh, rather than waiting until they're you know, much further down the line when, when your program is bigger and your, uh, when, it, when it's more expensive to resolve. Um, so you can still use you know, a kind of iterative approach, but you do it at the highest possible level of abstraction. Um, so let me go into more details about what concretely do I, do I mean by this, or what, what have we tried that, that I, what I'm saying is I think this works out. Um, we're, we are still in the process of doing this, but um, I think it works out. So um, the wallet, the wallet backend, this is a, the, this example, it doesn't, if you don't know what a wallet is, it doesn't really matter. It's just a component within, within a larger cryptocurrency system. So the way that we approached this was to, um, we, were, we were rewriting this component because the first time it was done, it turned out just to be no good at all. Uh, and so we're like, okay, we'll have to go back, back to throw, throw this one away and, and start again and do it properly. Um, so uh, myself and another person started writing down a precise specification of what is it that it means to be a cryptocurrency wallet? What is a cryptocurrency wallet? Or what specifically is this system's cryptocurrency wallet supposed to do? Um, and, and the way we wrote that was using mathematical notation uh, and uh, so simply set theory, Noth nothing more complicated uh, than that, set theory and, and, uh, and logic. Um, and, and taking that approach forces you to be precise and it forces you to think clearly and to try and simplify the problem as much as possible. You're, you're, you're sort of fiddling with this thing until it becomes, until you find something that is simpler. And, and that's usually more likely to be what you want. Um, and this, you know, doing this in this very concise notation of, of you know, mathematics, of set theory and logic, lets you write these things in this very concise way. Um, and that can, it helps you to fit more in your head at once, uh, I think is often one of the big things. It, you know, I'll show you in a second, uh, oh, do I have that? Yeah, here we are. This is, I don't expect you to read this. The, the main point is that it fits on one slide. And this is essentially the complete specification at a very high level of abstraction of what a cryptocurrency wallet should do, what, what its key 
state is, what the key operations, how it updates as blocks arrive off the system, and what is my balance? That's, that's the other key thing that it does. It tells you what the balance of your wallet is as, as the blockchain evolves. Um, so that is, okay, too small to read, but at least it is small enough to fit on one slide, and that correspondingly means it's small enough to like, fit in my head at once. And that means that you can see some of the tricky issues up front that otherwise you would only discover later on. So that's one of the ways of bringing these things earlier and resolving them earlier and fiddling with the design until it becomes small because once it's down to something small, it's usually more likely to be the thing that you wanted. Um, and then, I mean, one of the, things, the interesting things here is that, you know, unlike you know, exercises that people set for their students, you don't know up front what the specification should be. You're, you're coming up with a specification of a thing but you don't know a priori that that is the description that is the right one. You have to not only write down, you know, here is a formal description of a thing, but you have to explain to yourself and to everybody else, why is this thing that I have specified, not only is it self-consistent, but it does actually correspond to what we believe a wallet is. Otherwise, it's just a piece of self-consistent mathematics. Um, and that's one of the things that you have to deal with when you're trying to specify a, a real-world system. Quite often, they don't have just obvious specifications. You have to convince yourself and other people that this is a reasonable specification of you know, this, this, this component. So, okay, so we, we, we state a bunch of lemmas or, or properties. Um, and and these, these are properties to help us convince ourselves that this is, this is a reasonable description of, of, a, of a wallet, like you know, that it respects certain kind of accounting identities or things like that. Um, and that, that helps to reassure oneself that, at least if, it, if you believe it does have those properties, that, okay, that probably makes it a reasonable description of, of, a, of a cryptocurrency wallet. So we state these lemmas, but we never prove them, or we, we don't prove them in the first sort of iteration, first phase of the, the implementation, but we test them. And that is usually good enough. Um, and that can find all kinds of bugs in the specification itself. You know, you find that it doesn't have that property that you thought it did, and then you, maybe you can tweak it until it does, or you realize why it shouldn't have that property. Um, and this approach really does lead to dramatically simpler and better implementations. Um, the, once you've got a specification that's small, you can quite often make an implementation that is similarly small. Uh, and if, if we compare, in, the, in this example, if we compare the original kind of ad hoc implementation with the, the new one that's derived from this specification, um, it's order of magnitude smaller and simpler. Um, so once you have a formal specification like that, um, so I, I say, I mean, this, is for, this is a formal specification, even though it's you know, not in any kind of theorem proving system, but it is you know, a formal language. Um, you then want to know, okay, well, I need to do a real implementation. Um, how do I know that that corresponds to this stuff? Um, and the, a, a very useful general purpose approach here is, is kind of reference implementation testing. Um, some of you may recognize this as a commuting diagram, but that doesn't matter too much. Um, the, the point is that we can have, uh, we, take, we take the mathematical specification and we can translate this almost one-to-one -one into Haskell. Um, and we can do that because we deliberately designed the, the mathematics such that we could do with the, the, the notation and the techniques that we were using uh, is such that we can do a, a very straightforward translation into an executable version in Haskell. So that gives us an executable specification. And then we want a, then we, we go and write a, a real implementation as well. Um, and then to test that the real implementation is a correct implementation of the, of the specification. Um, we, we take this random testing approach, uh, and what are we testing? We're testing that if you start from a value down here, so a, a real state of the system, and you do some kind of trans transition, like a new block arrives, or one of these kind of state updates, um, and you do that both for the real implementation and for the executable specification, there's an abstraction function that goes from the state of the real system to the state of the simpler, uh, the abstract version of the system. Um, because the, these are supposed to be kind of, they, these should work in lockstep, but there's a, but the real implementation has much more detail. I mean, that's why, that's why it's an abstraction. The, the abstraction deliberately forgets or ignores details that are, 
uh, that we consider to be not important. Um, so, for example, this specification doesn't say anything about the cryptography. Um, it's really focusing on the state management of, of a wallet. So, the abstraction function goes from the complicated real types into the much simpler by throwing away the details that we don't care about. So if we can generate random sequences of uh, operations on the, on the wallet, which we can, that's fairly straightforward, uh, and we start from some initial state of the uh, abstract version and the concrete version, then we can just apply these sequences of operations and we can check at every point that the concrete one has an equivalent state to the abstract one. And that tells you pretty well that your real implementation is a correct uh, implementation of, of the executable specification and correspondingly, therefore, the, the, the mathematical version. So this, this gives you actually really good evidence that what you've implemented is what you thought is what you intended to implement. Um, and we found you know, many bugs uh, by doing this. Um, I mean, we were taking this approach from the beginning, not, not, a, not as a retro... Uh, retrofitting it. Um, but yeah, we, you, know, you, make, you make mistakes in your real implementation because there's lots of details. Um, but we found and caught and fixed um, many of them. Well, all of the ones that we found. And I think you know, the, the, because it's only testing, it still doesn't give you a guarantee that they're the same. But it's really quite good evidence that they are. Um, and that's a much higher standard of evidence than you know, most normal uh, testing techniques or you know, ad hoc uh, unit testing or, um, or even, even property-based testing, but you're just kind of making up the properties. Um, this kind of testing against a you know, known good um, executable spec is, is a very powerful technique. And it's, and it's a very general technique. Um, um, I don't want to go through every example because I don't think I really have time. Um, let me very, very briefly uh, talk, about, talk about this one. Um, the cryptocurrencies have you know, a blockchain layer and then they have a, a ledger layer. The ledger layer is what are the rules of the currency as opposed to the, the blockchain. The blockchain is just a, a concurrent data structure, but the ledger rules is the accounting, you know, who owns what tokens. Um, so the way that we have been approaching uh, this in, in the re-engineering of the system for the next, the next version is that we prototype our, our ledger rules uh, on paper or virtual whiteboards uh, and, and, and LaTeX. Um, we write down these designs in this, in this formal notation. Uh, it keeps it small. We have quick review cycles between a small, a small team. Uh, and keeping it small and doing lots of review cycles like this allows many brains to be applied to ferret out the, the tricky issues and the, the thorny problems that you run into when uh, trying, to, trying to formalize what exactly are the rules of our, of our system. And th this really lets you resolve issues early when the system is small and it's easy to tweak things. Um, whereas you know, these, these same issues that we've run into here, you can see very easily um, w when you run into them that, oh, God, that would have been a nightmare to resolve down the road. I'm really glad that we found out about it now while it's still you know, uh, small and malleable. Um, so what do I mean, uh, just to illustrate? So this is, this is like a random snapshot of someone's whiteboard. I don't expect you to read it and understand it. It's more the fact that you can just jot these things down and think about it and then share it with your colleagues and then you go through these iterate. So you can still do this kind of iterative prototyping approach. You're just doing it at a very high level of abstraction in a formal notation. So yes, sort of, it's big upfront design. But no, really, it's just programming. It's just programming at a much higher level of abstraction than you do normally. And it's just, it's just a few steps away from being an executable specification or an executable simulation prototype down the road. So it's, it's an incremental process all the way down, starting from things that are just scrawlings on paper through to, um, OK, now we'll do it again, formalize it in, you know, now we'll do it in LaTeX, and then we'll go through more iterative cycles of review, and, oh, no, that's not quite right. Let's tweak that, tweak that, until eventually you get to something that you think is fine. And then you move on to... Um, doing the, the, Haskell, the Haskell version, and then that gives you your executable specification. You can quick check that, and then you, and it, and it goes on and on. So, but you're doing, as I say again, you're doing the, as, resolving as many problems as you can, as early as you can, while it's still small and easily tweakable. You have to pick the right level of abstraction when you, when you do this. You have to ignore the right things. Abstraction is all about ignoring stuff that's not important. Um, so ignoring the right things is, somewhat of an art. 
um, and, and trying to keep things sufficiently small, um, being able to fit more in your brain at once is a, is a major, major advantage. Um, there's a kind of a social aspect to that as well, right? If, if you have someone working on a great big complicated thing, you know, the number of people who are prepared to go and look at it is very small, low. Whereas if you have something that's much smaller and is easier for people to fit in their brain, you get much more review and then you, you, know, then you can apply more brains to the problem and you can spot things that you, might, that you might not have spotted because you simply have more people who are able to look at it and go, ah, oh, but what about, you know? Um, whereas, you know, when things are, you know, vast pull requests of, you know, th there's an inverse kind of relationship between the amount of review that you'll get and the size of things. I'm sure you've seen that. And you can, you can, you know, beat people until they review things properly. But that is, you know, the a fact of life that that's the kind of inclination of people. And um, so there is a real advantage to keeping things small um, and doing these kind of uh, iterative, rapid uh, review cycles at this very high level of abstraction. Okay. Um, yeah, this is this, this, the, the particular style that we chose here with, with all of this stuff is specifically to make it easy to translate into an executable Haskell version. So, I mean, the notation here is uh, you, you, you can go for things which are, mm, you know, not very constructive. This is very much a constructive, operational, computable style so that it's very straightforward to translate into Haskell. Uh, and that's that's deliberate, and very much deliberate. So um, I haven't said all that much about Haskell yet. Um, so we do use Haskell for the implementation. Um, and Haskell is, is very clearly not a silver bullet. I mean, I, I have seen this you know, as, as, a, as a consultant. I, I see lots and lots of different projects. Um, and you can write bad code in any language. But um, if you're taking a CS-heavy approach, uh, Haskell is very good, uh, and it presents far fewer barriers and irritations and makes it very straightforward to do things like translating from the formal spec into, into Haskell code and seeing that the two are equivalent um, just by inspection or um, just carrying over ideas. Um, so, okay, so what are the yeah, key approaches, key elements? Um, I've sort of talked about how we you know, try and do things early as possible. Um, pick, pick appropriate notations from computer science. You know, there's lots of different ways of describing things, um, and you have to pick ones that are appropriate for the context. So in some other contexts, we're using process calculus. Uh, here, we're using kind of state transition style schemes. And so there's bits of uh, notation and ideas that we can borrow, um, but you have, to, you have to know kind of, you have to be able to know what can you steal, what can you borrow, what's the right technique to apply here. Um, decomposition, abstraction, recomposition, I mean, that, that is absolutely critical to building complex systems, and Haskell makes that much easier. Um, so ha Haskell is a very big bonus when it comes to actually doing these implementations. Because you, you could take this formal approach and then go down to C or Rust or something. But um, Haskell makes it much easier to, to keep things um, compositional. Um, and, and specify and test components in isolation and understand the relationships between them. Um, yeah, I don't want to say any more about that. Uh, yeah, there, there's another kind of social aspect to, to going with Haskell here, is that um, people who like Haskell tend to be uh, happy to try more CS-heavy approaches and by applying more computer science, you get more benefits, uh, is my basic claim. Um, you, have to know, you have to apply the right ones, but if you pick the right ones, you can have real, real benefits. And, but you have to have buy-in from your team to do that. You can't just say, all right, we're going to go and do process calculus and whatnot if no one knows what that is, or if everyone is terrified of your big, funny symbols and squiggles. Um, you have to have some degree of buy-in, and um, it, Haskell people tend to be more keen to try it. Uh, even if you know, even if that's not their background directly, you know, many people have come to Haskell um, uh, who you know didn't do it through university, and so they don't necessarily have that kind of CS background. But often they have been attracted to it because it takes a more I don't know, CS heavy approach to things. Um, so that kind of culture is is very beneficial. Um, I, I said already that you can do these translations very easily. Um, oh, and this is very important: the being able to 
write a single implementation and run it both in simulation and for real is, is very, very useful. Um, there are many situations, particularly in things like networking and other kind of low-level gubbins, where it's very hard to test certain situations. It's very hard to do the setup that you need for tickling particular network failures. But if you can do it in simulation, it's very easy to trigger those failures and, and make sure that your system uh, responds appropriately. So being able to use exactly the same implementation that you interpret in a simulator and that you interpret for real uh, has a really big benefit for uh, that kind of correctness. I mean, in, in a sense, it's just like a mocking approach, but it's a very good mocking approach. Um, uh, I don't want to go into the details of this one. Um, da, 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 da. Oh, yeah, since I'm talking, this is the only slide with code. But since I was talking about simulation just a second ago, this is, this is a, a concrete way that, that we have been uh, doing simulation for bits of the system which are very I.O. and concurrency heavy. Um, so this is, a, this is a type class that captures the uh, Haskell's software transactional memory um, API. Uh, so Haskell, GHC specifically, has this uh, concurrency abstraction called STM, which many of you may know if you use Haskell or GHC at all and use it for concurrency. It's a composable uh, system for doing um, uh, concurrency with shared, shared variables uh, as opposed to locks and, uh, 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 well, yeah, yeah I, I don't need to go into the details of it. But we can, we can capture the API and abstract over the fact that it's I.O. and just say, you can do this in any monad. And then we can provide an, imp an, an instance of this uh, interface uh, for I.O. so that you can run this stuff for real. And uh, also in this sim I.O. Um, and this lets us d run in simulation things that use forking and use STM transactions concurrency a lot. Um, and then we can run the things in simulation and get a pure result out, which is a trace of the execution, uh, either a generic one or one that's specific to the thing you're working on. And that's, that, this is a really good way for writing tests, because in, in lots of concurrency approaches, the way that you specify what does it mean for this to be correct is to look at the trace of its execution and say, does that trace look right? Um, so it's a property over the uh, over the trace of its execution. So being able to just run this thing deterministically or be able to tweak the scheduling parameters to see if it makes any difference and then write a property over the trace of its execution is a very nice way of being able to test that your concurrent program does what you think it does. And that same program can just be executed directly in I.O. No, with no changes. So it's not like, well, here's a model, but we have to do something else for the real thing. This is the real thing. We can run it both ways. Um, so it, that's a very nice, uh, you know, that, that, and that's something that where Haskell makes that very easy to capture that kind of, um, do that kind of abstraction. Um, um, let's see. So transferable lessons. Um, oh, well, this is about you know the the, the system that we actually deployed a year ago, um, which has sort of been okay. I mean, it, it works. It's running. Um, uh, it, it's not something that I could say I'm hugely proud of. Uh, it was developed very, uh, very quickly um, by in, with using very you know, um, traditional approaches, let's say, um, not the kind of semi-formal development that I've just been talking about. That's, that's what we're working on now for the uh, upcoming releases of the system. Um, so I mean, less lessons here are that you know, the early stage, I mean, this is, this is tough, I'm sure. If you've worked on many projects before, you, you know. The early stages of new projects are critical. Um, you know, once you've gone six months down one route, it's very hard to, to, to change direction. Um, and, and the early versions of Kodano were developed yeah, quickly under this kind of time pressure that the cryptocurrency space uh, uh, engenders uh, and using fairly you know, traditional uh, approaches. Um, the performance was not clearly understood at the very beginning and that, that caused lots of problems later. Um, performance design, you, you can't just optimize at the end when you're doing these kinds of systems. Um, performance design has to be done early as well, um, which is actually an interesting challenge. You know, how do you, you know, all the stuff I've been talking about is, with these formal approaches it has, so far I've been talking about has been about functional correctness, not about, well, what is the performance of my thing going to be? How do I, how do, I do that same you know, idea of bringing, bringing the hard decisions and resolving the hard problems early 
on the performance front and not just like build it and then discover, oh no, it doesn't meet the performance requirements. I have to throw it away and start again. That's actually a really interesting challenge, but I don't have time to, you can ask me about that later if you're interested. And the, you know, uh, everybody knows who's worked on distributed systems. Uh, distributed concurrency and networking are hard. Um, and if you just go at it ad hoc, you'll make all the mistakes that you would expect. Um, and the, you know, the corollary is hard problems need more formal approaches. And that's you know, what we are, we are, we are doing. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the, the, the main lesson I would say here is that you, you, if you're building complicated systems like this, you, you can't get away with just taking traditional approaches. You know, build it and cut corners. Um, you, know, the, you, you may get a system that works, but it, it won't be what you really want. Um, I think it, it really is worth, and it's not necessarily all that much slower to do things properly. Um, and, and these lightweight formal methods gives you a really good trade-off between you know, significantly better quality than traditional methods without it being significantly slower. Uh, and possibly, if anything, could be faster because the time taken to fix all the bugs at the end is much reduced. Um, so, yeah, we're doing all this new sort of development uh, using this semi-formal approach. Um, and as you know, new versions are coming along and new components are being built, we are building all the new components following this, this approach. Um, I talked about the, uh, the wallet backend already. Um, I talked a little bit about this already, um, that you know, Haskell people tend to be more, uh, and I'm sure the same is true in other language communities, that uh, they tend to be more open to, to, to applying these kinds of um, you know, CS-heavy uh, approaches. But it does, it does really require team buy-in, and um, that, that can be a struggle sometimes. Um, but yeah, most people are prepared to learn, even if they are not you know, yet ready, yet comfortable. Um, so sometimes you may have to do some training, but that's okay. You know, a lot of people are very keen to, to take up those kinds of opportunities and, and apply more formal approaches to things. Um, uh, and mixed teams also work. So you can have, uh, this has been my experience, so you can have you know, te teams that have some people who are, um, you know, who have a lot of CS heavy background and experience, along with people who are more, you know, hackers and engineers. And so long as there's right right attitude in the team, you can that can work quite well. Um, so it doesn't have to be just, you know, you can only hire your PhD computer science people. A mixture is 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 just fine. Um, so for example, for IOHK, we have run in in um, in partnership with uh, Cubic. Uh, run um, training programs for the developers uh, on specifying and testing using quick check um, as, a, as an example. Um, yeah, I shall pause there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we've just got two minutes until the break, so it's going to be quick. Uh, uh, sorry. It's <laughs> after. Just out of curiosity, do you take any advantage from uh, applying uh, lazy evaluation to what you do? And if so, could you give us an example? Lazy evaluation, yes. Um, in, in the way that you can capture um, certain kinds of computations as data structures, that technique relies fundamentally on, on lazy data structures. And we make use of that quite a lot. Kind of the, the free monad idea. Um, so mul multiple interpreters over the single syntax, those, those things very often rely on laziness. And I'm sure there's incidental uses of laziness all over the place that I don't even think about because it's just the natural way to do things in Haskell. Um, but yeah, there's at least that one, that kind of DSL, free monad interpreter approach, which is what we need for that simulator um, that rely on laziness. Yeah. Okay, quick one. Um, right. Uh, well, thanks a lot for the talk. Um, my question, so in the beginning you were talking about um, how it's difficult to bring uh, science and development in a company. Mm. And I was wondering if in the using this implementation and function, the um, oh, yeah. square, yeah. that do you um, use that for bringing those two teams together? Yes, yes, I didn't, I didn't mention that, but that, that's absolutely right. So one of the reasons that we choose to write these kinds of specifications using kind of very simple set theory and predicate logic is precisely because it allows, it, it's a common language that you know, one group can look at even though they're not programmers, and then the programmers can also look at 
even though they're not you know, cryptographers. So it gives, it gives a common language that the cryptographers can look at that and go, yes, that is indeed what I meant. And then you know, the other computer scientists and programmers can go from there and show that, produce evidence that their programs implement that thing. And the, the cryptographers look at that thing and it is in a language that they can understand. And so that is, yeah, that is very important. And that, so yeah, at one level, that, that executable spec, that's something that can be checked by those researchers. Um, or at least the, the paper version of the spec can be checked by the researchers. Yeah. yeah, so it's all about producing evidence of the connection all the way through, down to the implementation from these very high-level you know, academic papers. Um. Okay. Great, so maybe we can continue the questions. Yeah, anyone else got questions? Break. I'm Thank you, Duncan. Hang around on the break. Thank you.